All right, that's what I like to hear. Still asleep. All right, let's wake everyone up. Um, touch your nose. Uh, touch your head. Touch your belly. Okay, now let's see if you can. Can anyone do it? Can anyone actually do it? Stand up if you can do it. Stand up if you can do it. There we go. There's the freak show in the back right there. That part wasn't in the notes. That was just not. Raise your hand if you think it's a thousand degrees in here. Very good. Very good. Is there anything you can push up into the zero button anywhere? So how many Indian Orthodox does it take to... Uh, <laughs> just joking. Just joking. Just joking. Okay, while we see if we can address that, let's get out our packets. Okay, and get over to handout number two. And let's quickly... Okay, you guys help me out here. First of all, I told that very nice lady who gave a speech about how to give a, a public speaking that I'm very honored to speak after her, and I'm sure that you guys the whole time will tell me all the stuff that I did wrong based on her lecture. So please try not to judge me on that. I didn't catch you at the end of it. All right. Remind me of what we spoke about in the first talk. Raise your hand. Tell me what you spoke about. Yes, sir. Dreams. Dreams. Okay, very good. What about them? There's five kinds. No, that's incorrect. <laughs> huh? Okay, there's five ways, things that we can do to discover that dream. If someone's taking a step back, why are we talking about dreams? Who cares about dreams? God has dreams for our lives. Alright, God has dreams for our lives. Remember our verse we talked about right here? Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar like eagles. And that's what we want to live like. Remember I talked in the beginning that there's two kinds of life. There's life by sight and then life by faith. And you've got to choose. You want to live by faith or you want to live by sight? Live by sight, that's where the majority of the people live. That's where what you see is what you get. Life's pretty boring. Life's pretty bland. Life stinks. Life with purpose, life with meaning, life according to God's plan, that's life of faith. All right? And that begins with a dream that God gives us. And that dream, we talked about how to discover it, and that was the five steps of how to discover it. Can anyone remember what the five steps were? One, D. Dedicate what? All oh my life to God. We sign the check, we say, God, I'm yours, holy yours, forever yours, forever, forever, ever. And then you tell me what you want me to do. Second step? Reserve what? Alone time with God. Okay, because to hear God's vision, you must turn off the television. Alright, you gotta have some quiet time with God on a regular basis. Third? Evaluate the gifts, the passion, the talents what God has given me. God put inside you things that you care about that I couldn't care less about. And that's cool because that's from God. But some people care very much about the homeless. Some people care very much about the orphans. Some care very much about what's going on in the Middle East. Some care very much about the whatever. Everyone cares about different stuff. That's from God. Four, associate with godly dreamers. Okay? Evil company corrupts good habits. Make sure you're hanging out with the right crowd. It's contagious. And then number five, make public. First, I visualize, and then I verbalize what it is that God wants me to do. That was that first phase. That was that dream phase. I, I, I want you to believe me on this one. You may not ever come up with a cure for cancer. You may not, not ever become a missionary or a monk or a nun or a priest or whatever. But that certainly doesn't mean that you can't do big things for God. Every area of your life, God has a dream for. You have money in your pocket. God has a dream for how you're going to use that money. You have time that God has given you. However many days on this earth, God has a dream for how you're going to use those days. You have relationships that God has given you. God has a dream of how you're going to use those relationships. A way that you can use those to further His kingdom and glorify His name. So that was the first step to come up with a dream. But now that you come up with a dream, a dream is really of no value without step two, which is a decision. And we're going to talk about here today, or this session right now, is making decisions. Now here's the thing about decisions. You think, 
in the first session, I'm talking about dream big and dream and, and all this kind of like big visionary kind of stuff. Well, now, I'm not going to contradict myself, but for those who don't feel comfortable with the, it seems like it's too broad, and it seems like, you know, we all walk up and run out like crazy people. Now, the other people are going to be very happy. Because even though we dream big, we don't just run out of these doors and run out willy-nilly and just go and quit our jobs and quit our school and just go do whatever. We need to make sure we make godly decisions. And what I'm talking about is how to make godly decisions when it comes to dreams and life of faith, but it really applies to every decision that you make, is how to make godly decisions. The problem that we have sometimes in this country is we place a very high value on people who make quick decisions and who can think quick on their feet and who can act decisively and quickly. And thinking quickly is very good and deciding quickly is good. But I would rather focus on the rightness versus on the quickness. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says the following. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Do you know what that means? The double-minded man, unstable in all his ways? Well, maybe. Well, then I, and I don't know. And yeah, let's go do this. Well, actually, I want to do this. Let's go do this. What? That person never received anything from God. What we want to talk about now is how to take this life of faith to the next step and make a decision. Y'all remember Moses when God appeared to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And God said to Moses, the burning bush, what did God tell him? What was God's message in the burning bush? Hey, Moses, I got great news for you. What's the great news? It said, people have been crying, and I heard their cries, and I'm going to deliver them. I said, okay, that's great, God. I've been waiting for that for a long time. But God said, it's not done yet. Not only am I going to deliver them, you're going to be their leader. And you're actually going to deliver the people out of slavery, out of Egypt, out of, of, of that wicked land. But I said, okay, God, that's great. God said, okay, I think that's great. Now you go to Pharaoh. Moses said, I beg your pardon? You go to Pharaoh. You see, from the very beginning, if you read in, in, in Acts chapter 7, okay, when St. Stephen spoke about his famous speech, he spoke about Moses. Moses, when did Moses get the dream to deliver the people out of Egypt? When? In the burning bush? In the burning bush? Uh -uh. Forty years earlier. You know the story when Moses killed the Egyptian? Okay? It says that he killed the Egyptian. Why? Because God had put it on his heart that you're going to lead the people out of here. So Moses said, okay, this is great, God. Let's do it. And he saw it. He said, okay, let's go. <laughs> and he's going to do it one at a time like that. And God said, no, Moses. You're right on the dream, but you made the wrong decision. I want to use you, and I am going to use you, and I put that passion in your heart, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it, remember? Whatever. <laughs> we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it my way. So God sent him off to the wilderness 40 years. After 40 years, God said, okay, now it's time. Now you need to take a step. What would you say if you're Moses? Go to Pharaoh? What does going to Pharaoh mean? If you were in writing in Moses' journal, going to Pharaoh equals what? Death. Death, Pharaoh was the most wicked man alive, and he's been saying for 40 years, anyone who sees this Moses boy, kill him and bring me his dead body. And I'm just march into his office and say, can I have a meeting? Death. So basically, here's what happens. This is what God always does, right? God comes and gives us this dream, and we want to do it, and then God says no, and then later on, God comes and says, okay, now, but by this time, okay, God, it's too late. Like, it's impossible. Like, God, what you're asking me to do, it's impossible. It can't be done. So you know what? So I'm going to go back, and I'm just going to say, you know what? I wanted to do this great thing for God, but God, like, closed the door. Like, I was ready. I was ready, and I told him, God, let's do it. But God came up with this crazy plan. Go to fair. Like, God, God, I tried. I wanted to. And it wasn't that I'm not willing. I'm willing. And if God had given me machine guns, I'd be the first one. 
I'm going to repair. And if God had given me weapons, oh, yeah, I go. But God doesn't know what he's doing. Or God doesn't want me. Or I must not be special enough. Or I'm not spiritual enough. Or I'm too bad. Or you know all that other nonsense that we say. I wonder how many dreams get killed between step one and step two. Because you make bad decisions. How many dreams get killed between step one and step two? Goal today? How to make wise decisions. We don't want to just sit on our couch and sit there and say, well, this dream stuff, this big stuff, this is for other people, it's not for me. We want to see how we make godly decisions. And like I said, if it's in relationships, money, time, career, all this stuff, you need to learn the process by which you make godly decisions. We're going to see some wise counsel from the Bible. First step, the Bible says, that we always begin when making a decision with praying for guidance. And I want to, I don't know how I can stress this enough. Okay, I wish there was another word for pray other than pray. Because sometimes we think pray for guidance I don't know how it is in y'all's church. In y'all's church, okay? But sometimes in our church, we do the following. We need to have a meeting to discuss this big issue. We need a big meeting and all this kind of stuff. Okay, let's start in prayer. If I'm so much, we're going to please God bless me and thank you for that. There's our prayer before the meeting. Okay, now we need to discuss it. We need to talk. We need all this stuff. And basically, the prayer at the beginning becomes a good luck prayer. Okay, no, no, let's start the meeting. We have to do the prayer. No, 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 no. Let's go quickly. It becomes a good luck meeting. And that's oftentimes our prayer song. I gotta make this decision. Okay, we're not talking about good luck prayer. We're talking about prayer. We're talking about me saying, God, I don't want what I think is wise, I want what you know is wise. I don't want my idea, I want your idea. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26 says, Those who trust in themselves are, say it with me, fools. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Show of hands, how many people? ever made a stupid decision thinking at the time it was the best decision ever? Very good. A lot of hands. Put your hands down. Next question. How many people that didn't raise their hands are pathological liars? <laughs> Very good. Every one of us has done it. We make decisions all the time. Yes! This is the answer on my problem. This is the best thing. And, oh. <laughs> Can't trust yourself. Can't trust your feelings. Can't trust your emotions. You know where emotions come from? Do you know where they come from? Exactly, because they come from everywhere. Okay? Sometimes they come from the weather, and the weather is, is gloomy, so we're gloomy. The weather's nice, so we're nice. They come from the people around us, everyone else around us is, is, is sleepy, so yeah, sometimes you get sleepy. They come from what you eat. Okay? I know I had some emotions going on after lunch this morning. Okay? <laughs> Can't trust emotions. Can't trust yourself. Trust in God. The worst thing, and I always tell this to people, someone comes home from work and he is grumpy and the boss is on his case and I hate that man, I hate my job, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I always tell the same thing. I don't care if you quit or don't quit, but don't quit today. Quit two weeks. Because if you still feel that same way, after you've calmed down, you've gotten a good night's sleep and a nice sandwich, you still feel that way in two weeks, then quit. That's fine. But don't just come home all emotional. Quit. Same thing that happens all the time in relationships. We got into a fight just now. I hate that woman. I hate that man. That's fine. You want to hate him, hate him after two weeks. But don't hate him now. Calm down. Think logically. Make a good decision. I always say, the best decision I ever made in my life is when I married my wife. That rhyme. Aww. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> hey, just because I'm a priest doesn't mean I don't need the rounding points just like the rest of y'all. Okay? <laughs> but I'll tell you, the night before the wedding, there were some emotions going on, and most of those emotions were saying, "Run for your life." Okay? Can't trust emotions. Can't trust your gut feeling. Now, with that said. I don't want to negate the importance of emotions and decisions and the gut feeling. I'm not against it. I'm for it. Very much for it. But I'm not for it in the beginning. And not for it in the beginning. All the times you go through the process that I'm going to outline, and then you're struggling, you go with your gut, that's fine. I'm not against that. 
But what I'm against is, right from the get-go, this is my gut feeling, this is what I feel like I should do, and you go off and you make that decision. So we need something greater than our gut to make a decision. Every one of these steps, I'm going to give you a question to ask, because the wisdom comes from asking questions. question you need to ask, what does God want? Not what do I want, not like I said, what's my gut feeling, not what's going to make me happy. Sometimes what God wants is the exact opposite of what makes you happy. Sometimes what God wants is the exact opposite of what makes you happy. Now I know this, like how can that be? Because God is all about joy, not so much about happiness. Because happiness is short term. Happiness is very temporary. And you know that you can be in a tough circumstance, not very happy, but full of joy. And you can be around all kinds of happy circumstances and be empty on the inside. Happiness is outside, joy is inside. So oftentimes, what God wants is the exact opposite of what makes you comfortable, what's convenient, what's easy. So we start by asking this question, God, what do you want? Like I said in the last, the last talk, dedicate, I say, God, I'm going to do what you want. And that's the starting point. I'm going to do what you want. Now, I need to just figure out what you want. But the starting point is, I'm going to do it without even knowing what it is, I'm going to do it. The second step, you get the facts. You start collecting data. Now wait a minute. Don't we just pray and faith and like God inspires? No, no. It'll be fun. Having faith and gathering facts are not contradictory to one another. In fact, they work together. The Bible says these next two verses. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man acts with knowledge. And Hosea 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of of knowledge. My people are destroyed because they don't have enough information to make decisions. One of the things that I don't understand in this world, one of the mysteries, you know how they say no, there's the seven wonders of the world, there's like mysteries. I don't understand. You ever watch those infomercials on daytime TV? Me? Okay, when I work out, I work out like during the daytime. All right, and when I work out, put myself in front of the TV, turn on my ESPN, a sports center, or a TV, pardon the interruption, okay, PTI, and that's how I work out. So I watch, like, daytime television. Okay, that's, like, the only TV that I watch. So I'm working out, and I'm watching. And every day, without fail, there's that infomercial. And it starts off with this fat guy with this Hawaiian shirt. And the hair is so slick, you can eat off it, okay? And he's... Yeah, you know if it wasn't the best expression. <laughs> but you know where I'm going. So you got the fat guy, the slick hair, he's got the beard, and then of course, 17 lovely ladies in bikinis all around. Okay? And he's like, hey, do you want to live rich like me? Then he goes and tells a story about he was some no good, nobody, nothing, and then he found this product or this book or whatever and made him rich. And you too can become rich in 17 days by just paying, you know, this $9.99 plus shipping and handling. And I'm almost thinking to myself, what idiot would order this thing? <laughs> and what kind of moron would do it? But then the more and more I see it, like I took economics, supply and demand. I know the fact that I see those commercials so much means there are a lot of idiots out there who are buying it. And there wouldn't be a commercial that wasn't idiots. <laughs> My dad taught me a lot of things in life, but I have one of the things he taught me. He taught me, no matter what someone's selling, I carry this for this my whole life, you never buy it over the phone. Ever. And some guy would talk and talk and talk, or a guy knocks on the door and talk and talk and talk, and my dad would always say, okay, leave me the information, and I'll get back to you. And of course, they never want to leave me the information. His point was, if it's a good deal, verbally and of me right now, it'll also be a good deal when I read all the papers. Get the facts first before you make decisions. Don't make emotional decisions. Don't just hear someone say, hey, this is good idea. Let's go start an orphanage in D.C. Okay, let's go leave your job. Relax. Relax. Make a good decision. 
We want to dream. And I'm not against dreaming. And you know how I was saying about dreaming. But you have to temper the dreaming. Like, we don't want to be either extreme. We don't want to be just dreaming willy-nilly, running off like crazy people. But we also want to be people that, that can't see things in the life of faith. We want to be people that start off with God's dream. But then we also, we, we do things wisely. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. And I was looking at other translations of this verse, and I found a cool translation in the Living Bible. It says it even more, like, bluntly. It's stupid to decide before knowing the facts. <laughs> it's about as blunt as you can possibly be. It's stupid to decide before knowing the facts. Why is it that a lot of marriages in this country don't end well? Because a lot of people go in without knowing the facts. And I'm not saying that anyone is perfect or anything like that, but what I'm saying is a lot of people don't understand marriage. I'm not saying necessarily the partner, because they may know a lot about their partner, but they don't understand marriage, how marriage is supposed to work. That's why in our church, you ain't getting married unless you have premarital counseling. And we sat and talked together, and I told you how marriage works. <laughs> So here, we ask the question, what do I need to know before making this decision? What do I need to know? I want to be a priest. Okay, great. I feel that calling is from God. That's great. But let's, let's be practical here. What do I need to know? I need to know where I'm going to live, how I'm going to eat, what I'm going to do. I'm not saying these things are going to stop me from doing it, because I feel it's from God, but I need to know the answers to these questions. There's nothing against faith. Third thing, ask for advice. Get wise counsel from spiritual, godly people. This is your father of confession. This is your spiritual God. This may be your father, your mother, your best friend, depending. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's necessarily your father. It depends. But this is the godly person who will guide you in a godly direction. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6 says, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. Get the wisdom of others. You're not the smartest person in the whole wide world, and I'm not the smartest person in the whole wide world. But here's, here's the thing, is I know some stuff, and you know some stuff. And that guy knows some stuff. So if we put all our stuff together that we know, then all of us become smarter. Y'all heard of Henry Ford, right? Henry Ford. Henry Ford said the following, Sometime, one time someone asked him, what's the secret of success? So he answered, wise decisions. Secret of success, make wise decisions. The person asked him, how do you learn to make wise decisions? He said, by experience. They asked him, how do you get experience? He said, from making stupid decisions. I want to learn from my stupid decisions, but I also believe I can learn from your stupid decisions. And I don't need to watch you fall, like you fall into that hole. I don't need to go in there and say, is it really a hole, and walk in myself <laughs> to figure out. I can just wait for you to get out of it, and you say, don't go near it. We need to learn from the advice and counsel and experiences of others. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18. Plans are established by seeking advice, so if you wage war, obtain guidance. Our problem is, maybe this one relates more, a little bit more, to the men than the women. We don't like to ask for advice. It's kind of like asking for directions. We don't really like it. It always gets us in trouble. True story. This is about uh, maybe six months, eight months ago, something like that. We had moved into a new house. We moved into a new house about two years ago. So this is about, we've been in the house for about a year now when the story takes place. All of a sudden, we have two garage doors. All of a sudden, they stop working. Like, no electricity. Like, the garage doors won't work. And my wife calls me one day, and I'm like, you know, I'm at church now, I'm busy, like, whatever. When I come home, I'll look at it. So, you know, me, man, I get my toolbox to look at it, and I'm like, oh, you know, something, uh, and I'm like, you know, plugging stuff in, and, I and the whole garage seems to have no electricity whatsoever. So I'm like, no problem, circuit breaker. So I go to the circuit breaker, and everything looks fine. 
And then I'm walking around the house and I'm pushing the test and the reset button and I'm, you know, tightening stuff and unscrewing stuff and stuff is flying on and I'm, you know, I'm doing stuff. Nothing. Nothing needed to work. So I say, you know, she's like, what's the status? I'm like, oh, you know, it's just, uh, I, I need a part to order and uh, I can do it next week. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? And I go online and I read all kinds of stuff, the short circuit on, reading all this kind of stuff, doing all this stuff. Two weeks, still in the garage. And she's getting annoyed because she can't park in the garage. We have to park outside. She's getting annoyed. So I'm like, don't worry, I got under control. And she says, the last thing anyone wants to hear, why don't you ask, and then she said the name of a guy who was a part of our church, who's a know-it-all, he's the smartest guy in the whole wide world, he can fix anything, yeah, 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 I've heard the story before. Why don't you just ask, his name's Uncle Amin, ask Uncle Amin. And I'm like, I got it. And she's like, no, I think Uncle Amin, I'm like, I got it. And of course, I have no idea what I'm doing. We spent about a month with no garage, and I've tried everything in the whole wide world, and I've broken half of the things that I've tried. <laughs> Finally, she, got, she becomes smart. She stops telling me to ask Uncle Me. You know what she does? She asks him himself, okay? She asks herself. She calls him up, see him the next day, and he's like, why didn't you tell me you had a problem with your garage? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, nah, it's fixed. He says he's coming over. He spent approximately 2.4 minutes <laughs> and the whole thing was fixed. <laughs> In life, you have to make a decision whether you want to be wise or appear wise. We need to learn to ask the most difficult words in the English language, can you help me? We need to ask for help. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an idiot. We need to learn how to say these things. Those of us, and again, I'm the first one of this, who don't like to ask for help, we think, this is what we say to ourselves, no, we don't want to trouble people. It's not really we don't want to trouble people. It's for arrogance. And it comes to a pride thing. Like, even Jesus himself allowed people to serve him. He allowed people to care for him. Why? He was there. Us? We struggle with that. If you don't want to ask for help, then most likely you want to appear wise more than be wise. And you may have a problem with your ego. And also in addition to that, I would say you're also stupid. And I would say you're stupid, not because I'm saying it, but because the Word of God says that you're stupid. <laughs> Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is... Stupid, it's a chance to say it in a biblical context, okay? He who hates correction is stupid. Fourth step. Calculate the cost. Realize that every decision you make has a cost, has a price tag. Anyone taking economics? Taking econ? Y'all heard about opportunity cost, right? Every decision has a cost. If I do, if I go with you to this place, that means that I will not be doing this activity instead. There's other things that I could be doing that I'm choosing to not do. If I spend a dollar here, that means it's a dollar that I'm not going to spend here. So you must calculate the cost of your decision. There's no decision, even the most trivial one, that doesn't have at least some kind of cost associated with it. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. It is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider one's vows. You know, oftentimes people ask me, life is so busy, life is so busy, life is so busy, how do we have time to be spiritual and read our Bible and to serve in the church? And how do we have time to focus on our career? And if we're married, to like spend time with our wives and our kids, and how do we have time, how do we have time, all this kind of stuff? Look, I'll give you a lesson in time management and stress management in one word, in one sentence. You learn this one sentence, it will save you so much stress and headache. When someone asks you to do something, you say the following. Can I get back to you later? That's it. Can I get back to you later? That's what I do. Someone says, I need to talk, I need you to come over to my house, I need this, I need all that kind of stuff. Sure. Can I get back to you later? You know what that does? Can I get back to you later? Even if it's just a little bit of time, it gives you time to calculate the cost. 
It gives you time to say, okay, this is important. Well, if it's so important that I'm willing to not do this, someone says, let's go play basketball. Quick answer is, sure, let's go. All right, let me get back to you. Let me realize I haven't seen my kids in three days. Okay, so I have to calculate the cost. Never say yes on the spot. Never be quick. Be right. That's why I love, I didn't put the verse on your handout. You know James 1.19? You guys know that verse? James 1.19? Let every man be swift. It's not on the screen, sorry. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak. We need to learn to be that way. Some of us speak quickly, speak rationally, or irrationally, and we get ourselves into stuff. <clears throat> the principle of life is this, is it's always easier to get into stuff than to get out of stuff. It's always easier to get into trouble than to get out of trouble. It's always easier to get into commitments than out of commitments. That's why don't be quick to commit. I never met anyone who says, you know, my life is so boring, I'm not committed to enough things. No one says that. What our problem is, we're committed to too many things. It's always easier to get into problem than get out of problem. So be careful before you get in. <coughs> Ask yourself before you make any decision, what is it worth? What is it worth? Even Jesus himself said, only a foolish person would build a tower without first counting the cost. Like, we don't just see, what he said is, you don't just look and see, hey, there's a couple of bricks, let's build a tower. And then realize, well, I don't have any more bricks. Or you don't see, hey, there's a bad guy, I got a gun money, let's go fight, without counting that he's got 10,000, you've only got your stuff. Calculate the cost. As you calculate the cost, one of the things that you will no doubt notice is that there will be problems that you will see coming. So you prepare for the problems. Prepare for problems. Because no matter what decision it is, no matter how godly it is, and especially when it's a decision from God, 100% you're going to find problems. We're going to talk about this much more in the next session, but for now we'll just kind of talk about it real quick. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3 says, The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. There's no such thing as a dream that was accomplished without fighting through some problems. So everyone who's a wise person always asks the following question. What could go wrong? The wise person is the one who's one step ahead of the problem. Who knows this could go wrong. Now be very careful, and this step is something very important. That when you prepare for problems, you must know the difference. There's a difference between preparing for a problem and solving a problem. We don't need to solve all the problems to take a step of faith. In fact, you can't solve all the problems. But we just need to be prepared for them. Never confuse decision making with problem solving. Y'all remember John F. Kennedy? John F. Kennedy did something, I think it was in, in 1959 or 1960, I don't remember when. He stood up before the entire country and he said, by the end of the next decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. He said that. Had he thought about the problems that were going to be that were going to be in front of him to, to, to make that happen? Had he thought about those problems? Yes. Had he solved those problems? No. Like y'all y'all know the story? That when he said it, actually the people in NASA, no one had expected him to say it. They hadn't yet discovered the technology that could be that was needed to get up there. So basically what he was doing was he was putting them on the spot and saying these guys are going to come up to the end of the next 10 years. They didn't have nothing, but he basically wanted to light a fire under them because that was the only way to motivate them. So he hadn't solved the problems, but he had prepared for the problems. He knew it was going to take money. He already said, you know what, it's going to take money. And he knew this and he knew that, but he didn't solve it. Same thing in life. I say, you know what, I want to get married to this beautiful girl. I solve all the problems? In no way. The problems ain't even started yet. <laughs> but I'm prepared for the problems. I know there's going to be times when we fight. I'm prepared. I know there's going to be times when we disagree on stuff. I know there's going to be big problems called kids. Okay? I know they're going to come. 
I'm prepared for them, even if I haven't solved them yet. Anyone who did ever, ever any did anyone who ever did anything great for God faced tons of problems to get there. But the difference is when you see them in advance and you prepare for them, they don't take you by surprise. They don't knock you down because you know they're coming. I keep talking about Mother Teresa because I feel like maybe I love Mother Teresa. Did y'all ever see the movie Mother Teresa? When they came out recently? Did y'all ever see the movie? Did y'all ever see the movie? Oh my goodness, you ever see the movie? Have you seen the movie? The movie's the best movie ever. The movie made me cry. And I don't even never cry. Alright? I didn't cry with my kids before, but I cried in the movie. <laughs> the movie's so beautiful. Mother Teresa. <laughs> ah, my kids are not bad too. <laughs> Mother Teresa, and she faced some stuff. She faced some stuff. She faced a lot of stuff. But she could see it coming. And she could say to her sisters, we're going to do this decision, and I know this is going to happen. And I know so and so is going to be against it. I know we're going to get persecuted. She believed it was right, and she went forward. That's the difference between problem solving, okay, and problem preparing for. You, God gives you a dream, Problems will come. Surely problems will come. Don't delay until you solve the problems. You never solve the problems. But just be prepared for them and move forward in faith. There's a lot of things in life that we move forward without understanding how they get fixed, but they still get fixed. Last step. Ultimately, when we prepare for problems, after we've gone through this whole process, we're probably going to end up our dream that we had in step one, our dream, our big dream. Now all of a sudden, we see all these obstacles that's all around you. And we're going to start to feel kind of scared. We're going to start to feel kind of hesitant. Maybe, and I don't know if we should, and all this kind of stuff. That's why. We started with prayer. We end with faith. You face your fears. The worst thing in life is that you get to the end of your life and you realize that God wanted to do great things in you, but you were too scared to take a step of faith. You know what the decision phase is like? In the beginning, I don't know if you saw it, I had a picture of a man on a trapeze. Okay? You know what the trapeze is? You ever been to a circus? Okay? You know the trapeze? Okay, that's what the guy is swinging on the thing. Okay? And then there's like he's swinging on this thing, okay. And then there's another thing, okay, for lack of a better term, what is this called? Swing, okay. Probably not a swing, but more than a thing, okay. That's fine, okay. So he's on one swing, all right. And then there's another swing he's got to get to. Now, I would be a very good trapeze artist if we could just revise the system a little bit. If I'm on this swing. And then you can make this swing come to a complete stop, okay? And this one come to a complete stop, and I can grab onto this one. Before I let go of this one, I'd be the best trapeze artist in the wide world. But that ain't trapeze. Trapeze means you're on this one, you gotta get to that one. But before you get to that one, there has to come a moment in time when you are neither on this one nor on that one. That's what I mean by face your fear. Moses is a ghostly pharaoh. Uh, but, uh, and because he was scared, he started to make funny excuses. But, uh, I'm not good at talking. Okay, well, I get you, Aaron. But, uh, you know, I've never been there in a few years. Uh, started to make funny excuses. Jeremiah, go be a prophet. Uh, but I'm too young. Started to make funny excuses. Do we do that? And like I said, we sit on our couch and say, well, when God comes to me and appears, I'm ready. I'm ready. We do that? Make funny excuses? God has a dream for your life. But in order to find it, you got to take a step of faith. And you're going to have to know a point in time where you don't know where that next meal is going to come from. Take a step of faith.
there come a point in time where you don't know if you're going to make it out of this. Take a step of faith. I don't even want, like, let, let me get rid of the big things. I don't want to make it so big. The small things. This is going to come a point in time when you're hanging out with a loser group of friends and you know God is telling you, leave the losers and go hang out over here. You're going to come a point in time to leave that group and that group hasn't accepted you yet and you're going to be with no group. Step of faith. Are you willing to face your fears? Take that step of faith. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. It says, He who observes the word will not sow, and he who, have, he who regards the cloud will not reap. You understand what that verse means? He who observes the wind will not sow. Why? What does that verse mean? What does that verse mean? He who observes the wind will not sow. If I'm sowing seeds, what do I want the weather conditions to be before I sow the seeds? I want no wind. Because wind might blow them. I want them just here. So it's saying, he who observes the wind, every day comes down and says, mm, slight breeze from the northeast, let me come back the next day. Is there ever going to be a day where there's no breeze whatsoever? He's saying, stop waiting for the perfect condition. That's why it says, same thing, he who regards the clouds, not breeze. He looks out and says, I see a cloud over there, you know, over yonder, 15 degrees. So you know what? Today's not a good day to go out. Sometimes you got to just take a step and say, you know what? I'm going to go. And it's not a dumb decision because you prayed. You got the facts. You got the wise counsel. You prepared for the problems. You got all your ducks in order. But there still comes a point in time where you got to take a step of faith. I ask you this question. You ask yourself this question. Where is my faith? Where's my faith? Romans 8.31 is one of the best verses in the Bible. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen to that. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Life of faith. You have faith. You believe in big God who does big things. You have faith. If I'm a dumb person and I come and I follow you around for one week, where will I see any evidence of faith in your life? Will I? Is there anything that's going on in your life that shows that you have faith? Or is this something that you just say, yes, I believe, and I mean, come to church, and we believe in one, yeah, hey, no, you believe, you believe, you believe. Let me follow you around like an idiot and just show me where in your life you're relying on God to do anything. Where there's one step, one ounce of faith in your life. Where you're just sitting on the couch, Listening to your sermons, drink a cup of coffee, and think you're the best Christian in the whole wide world, you're fulfilling God's plan for your life. Where's your faith? You got fear, you take Romans 8.31. You take Romans 8.31, you strap that thing onto your heart, and everywhere you go, you know, again, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying just run out willy-nilly. I'm saying you pray. You got the facts. You got the guidance. You prepare. You count the cost. You prepare. I'm not saying just whatever you come to your mind. I'm saying there's times, you know there's times, where you know exactly what God wants you to do, and you're scared to do it. You know exactly. There's times we struggle to know what God wants, but there's also times that we know exactly what God wants, but you're scared to do it. You take Romans 8.31, you tattoo it on your forehead, not literally, but symbolically. You tattoo it on there, and you go. And you go, and you see obstacles, and you say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let's go. You see a red sea in front of you, you say, if God is for us, who can be against us? You watch the sea split in two. How? That's how God is. And you watch sick people be healed, and you watch dead people be rise and raised, and you watch blind people be. Again, I'm not talking physically. Don't think I'm talking physically. I'm talking spiritually. You take that verse, you just watch God transform water stuff into wine stuff in your life. Too many of us sit on the couch, play it safe. Hey, I went to church this week. Leave me alone. Hey, I read the Bible. Tuesday. Leave me alone. That's your great life of faith. 
go to church? You went to church? Wow! Weren't you scared? Life of faith is more than go to church. I'm not saying don't go to church. I'm saying don't just go to church. I'm not saying don't read your Bible. I'm saying don't just read your Bible. God has dreams for your life. I want to leave you with a lesson from the great theologian, Dr. Seuss. It's on your handout. You can follow along here with me. Did I ever tell, it's called Ode to Zobe. Did I ever tell you about the young Zobe who came to two signs at the fork in the road? One said to place one, the other to place two. So the Zobe had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the Zobe scratched his head and his chin in his pants, and he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, now that place may be hot, and so how do I know if I'll like it or not? On the other hand, though, I'll be sort of a fool if I go to place two and find it too cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue, so maybe place one is the best, not place two. But then again, what if place one is too high? I may catch a terrible earache and die. So place two may be best. On the other hand, though, what would happen to me if place two is too low? I might get some very strange pain in my toe, so place one may be best, and he started to go. And he stopped. And he said, on the other hand, though, on the other hand, other hand, other hand, though. And for 36 and a half hours, that poor Zoe made starts and made stops at the fork in the road, saying, don't take a chance, no, you may not be right. Then he got an idea that was wonderfully bright. Play it safe, cried the Zoe. I'll play it safe, I'm no dunce. I'll simply start out for both places at once. And that's how the Zoe, who would not take a chance, got no place at all with a split in his pants. Yes. I thought it was worthy of talking to Thank you. I'm glad to talk to you. Talk to me. I didn't write it. Okay, talk to you. But you know what? Man. No notes. I just say this to you. I want to read notes. I want to say this from my heart. Life is too short to sit on the couch and do nothing. Life is too short. Man, God did a lot for you. He did a lot for me. You know that story in Luke 7 of that lady with the alabaster flask, a sinful woman who spiked, or not spiked, uh, broke that thing, poured it all over Jesus? You know that story? And I love that lady. I want to meet that lady when I go to heaven. She's the coolest lady in the whole wide world. Because she's someone who said, everything I got, man, I got to do something for Jesus. And what she did, long term, not very, like, what's the big deal? And kind of silly. And not, you know, doesn't seem like it's the greatest thing in the whole wide world. What Jesus said about her, Jesus loved what that lady did, because she did something. Life is too short to do nothing. How precious is your Jesus to you? How are you going to show them? We got to do something. We got to. We can't be like this guy who did. I don't know. Maybe not. We got to do something. Remember this verse. Remember this verse. All you're living for in life is to get a good job, get a nice retirement plan, get a beach house somewhere. That's what you're living for. All you're living for is just to take care of yourself in the here and now. That's what you're living for. Man, Jesus is too sweet, too precious, too good that you just see him sitting there. Like that's what the ladies think. You see him sitting there and I don't go off myself. Okay, give him a little oil. Not only a little oil. Too sweet. Too good. I give him everything. 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 Okay, at least no everything at the same time. Just everything. Because she can see how sweet he was. My question I leave you with is how sweet, how precious is he? 
what he will is due to children. Glory be to God forever. Amen.